Tony, welcome to what Bitcoin did, my man. Let's fucking go. Good to see you again, Peter. Good to see you. Uh, got to know you over the last couple of years. Heard about Mutiny. I didn't know it was you until we got to Nashville. Yeah, last week, a few days ago. <laughs> yeah, everyone's been talking about Mutiny as the coolest fucking project in Bitcoin, the coolest wallet, the coolest lightning project. Uh, and I get there and uh, yeah, I get told it's you, which is amazing. So it's really cool that someone I've got to know that's doing it. Um, how's it going, man? It's good, man. We we launched last week, but we've been we've been grinding for the last few months as an official company at the start of Q2 of this year. And me, Ben Carmen, and Paul Miller, we've just been killing it the last few months. We set a goal out, just like, hey, April first, we were like, let's let's shoot for the Nashville Lightning Summit, which was an amazing experience. Yep. Um, and we we killed it and we shipped it, and it's out there. So it's uh, it's a beautiful to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, big shout out to Rod. Big shout out to Odell. Big shout out to Harry. Crushing it at Bitcoin Park. Lightning Conference is great. Yeah, top notch. I mean, every year they put on bangers. Sorry, every month they put on bangers mm. uh, with different topics. So a lightning specific one is always a lot of fun to do. Yeah, competing here with Austin. I know, I know. I'm always flying back and forth between Austin. I'm glad it's only like a two hour flight because otherwise I don't think I would do it. But yeah, a little competition, but uh, we have our differences. Um, you know, we're a little bit more dev focused there in Austin. So it makes a little bit more sense for a dev focused team to to be here in Austin. But I love love the Nashville vibes every time I go there. So yeah, they they kill it every time. The Bitcoin Park, if you haven't been there, so you, you know, two houses almost and a nice studio. Um, I'm not. Yeah, you probably have shot down there a few times. Really, really impressive. Yeah, we've been we've been three times, two three or four times, three or four yeah. times. Yeah, we're now members. Nice. Uh, we're official members. Yeah, join as well if you're thinking if you're a Bitcoiner. Just join, support the project. Uh, it's important to have these spaces uh, around. Uh, so uh, this is your first time with the What Bitcoin Did crowd, uh, Tony. Can you give people your orange pill story? Because I think that's going to be a helpful build up to what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I I heard about Bitcoin early on, 2012 or so, when I was in high school. My dad told me, oh, don't touch it. You know, oh, it sounds like a fake thing. And I was like, you know, playing around with it. But I didn't really do anything with it until I, you know, graduated from college as a software engineer. Um, I worked at Defense for a little bit. And I was like, fuck this. Like, this is boring. Like, you know, I don't want to be responsible for uh you know, aircraft machinery that drops bombs on people. You know, I didn't feel comfortable with that. So uh, I just got involved in the Bitcoin Dallas scene, the Dallas, Texas scene. Um, that's where I kind of grew up in that area. Uh, from there, just started, I got involved in that community, picked up a job from a local um, blockchain company. You, you, Natalie Splinsky has been on a few times. Yeah. Yeah, I worked with her at um, Learning Machine at the time, and then, then it got acquired by Highland. Oh, we love um, Natalie. Yeah, she's, I love Natalie. She's, I think she's the coolest person that's come uh, into Bitcoin as like a prominent voice in the last couple of years. Like I know she's been around longer, but right. actually getting out of there, getting out there writing, getting on podcasts, I fucking love Natalie. Yeah. I, we, we've done, what, three shows with her? Yeah, I think three. Yeah, two two independent, one with Gladstein. She crushes. Yeah, I love those the best out of out of all the podcasts. I'd have to say that those are my favorite, oh, cool. along with the yearly Matt Odell ones at the end of the year. So those are fun too. Fuck but. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, has that one come out yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, what was the last one? I don't know. Last one he was yelling. Oh, we just did one a few days ago. Yeah, that'll be out tomorrow. God, we, I can't even remember. You know, you, they all merge into one. Were we being nice to each other? Uh, yeah, you're quite nice to each other. It's never yeah. fully nice. But. <laughs> He got, he got me to get rid of my blue check. Yeah. Oh, you got rid of it. Yeah, you shamed me into oh, it. Oh, man. Okay. Well, it worked, I guess. Pissed all him off. Shaming. I know. <laughs> no, no. He pissed him off that I did it. He was like, oh. I was all ready for you to fight me back. And then you just got rid of it. It's like, oh, what do I do now? I was like, well, you like, I agreed with his argument. Right. Okay. And then we had Marty on the next day and he had a good thesis for keeping it. I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Now I want to keep it. But it's, it's gone now. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, I worked, I worked with Natalie for a while and that was that was a ton of fun. I got acquired by Highland. I left shortly after that to go to Bottle Pay for a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we had a little bit of a history back then. I remember yeah. uh, I remember on Twitter, I was like giving you a little shit. Uh, and then you were like, you were giving me and Bottle Pay a little shit for some stuff going on at the time. And then we met. Did and, I? Yeah, yeah. We met and I actually got reprimanded for that. Damn, what happened? Yeah, they were like, well, it's a UK company. They're like, well, you know, 
Peters UK. You know, we don't want to we don't want to piss him off. So no, fuck that. Come yeah, on. Yeah, no, but they were like, hey, remove all affiliations with Bottle Pay and like you know, like you don't don't speak publicly about it anymore. So I was like, fuck that. Yeah. I wrote this huge article on Lightning Privacy because at the time, what we were getting shamed for at Bottle Pay was all of the Lightning compliance and on-chain compliance that we were doing while I was there. I was like, okay, fuck this. So I just came out with an article that basically said, here's how to get around every every Lightning privacy you know related thing to get around some of those controls. So I wrote this massive article. It was all out of like hate and spite for like them, what they were doing over there, you know, getting reprimanded for like speaking my mind on, you know, pub, you know, social media, like just as my own self speaking my own mind. So I just came out with this massive article. It was like a 25-minute read and it ended up being like the basis for everything I've done since then. Like I, I got on Citadel Dispatch from there. Um, it's pretty much been the you know, big primer on what does it mean to try to have privacy on top of Lightning. And from there, it's just, I left Bottle Pay, um, worked at Impervious for a little bit, and then, you know, was doing some contracting while we we're trying to figure out what to do with Mutiny. Um, we started working at the uh, BTC, or we, we had a hackathon with, that Lisa put on, mm -hmm. um, the uh Bolt, not bolt off on uh, base fifty eight. There was like a B oh BTC BTC plus plus hackathon. Right. But the whole idea of mutiny like was born. Um, it was called something else at the time. It was just some hackathon project name. And then we we're like, okay, what do we do with this? Um, ended up ended up at Voltage because I was doing some contracting there. And we were like, okay, well, me and Paul Paul worked at Voltage at the time. We were like, we want to focus on mutiny. Um, we eventually want to leave Voltage and go do something and, and start this company. And Voltage like completely supported us the whole way through. They said, hey, join the team, work half time at Voltage, building the lightning service provider for Voltage that is now being used to power Mutiny. So it was kind of like, like a handshake deal, like gentleman's deal. Like, hey, you do your thing, help us. And then, you know, we'll support you uh, when it comes time to leave to start Mutiny. So that's, wow. yeah. So I guess all in all, like, since 2017 getting involved and then from yeah now starting the company here in 2023 so that's a great a like, trajectory ride. man <laughs> so okay look a couple of things to unpack yeah. there uh firstly uh with the amount of people give me shit you don't always remember who's who and you certainly don't remember them the profile and the person mm -hmm. so i can't associate an argument on twitter or you give me shit with that being you. Right. I only remember you as Tony, the guy I hang out with sometimes, who I think is my friend. <laughs> and then, uh, so what, what, what were you giving me shit for? It was on, it was uh, probably Blockfly at the time uh, or, yeah, or one of those. Um, but it was funny because we were in Miami for Citadel Dispatch, the live one. Um, I guess the first Miami conference that existed, you showed up, we had like a pan, like Ty was there, Matt yeah. was there, a bunch of people. You're like, oh man, I, I really like you. Like, oh, let me follow you on, on Twitter. And then I pulled out my phone and showed you my Twitter profile. I was like, oh, that's you? You yeah. give me shit on Twitter yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, do you know what? That's happened a few times. And like, I'm, firstly, I'm okay with that. Right, because man. most of the time, I think you, you meet in person, you get to know each other and you're like, Actually, they're all right. And do you know what? You got a fair point. Like the block fight thing. I've, I've, I think I've regularly walked that one back. I I, I didn't see it coming. I, I yeah. use block fight, but like I, I get it. Um, uh, but also, I, do, I don't like the idea of bottle plays and saying to you, don't give Pete shit, you know, because they're censoring you because they think they might want me to might say nice things or yeah. like people on the pod. No, I don't like that. I mean, yeah. I'm more likely to reject bottle pay knowing that. Right. But they've gone kaput anyway. Yeah, yeah, they they shut down. Nidig shut them down. I, I think a month ago or so. Yes. Uh, I mean, Pete's a great guy. It wasn't it wasn't mm. from Pete. It was like HR related things. So <laughs> you know, I was just like, okay, whatever. Like that's not Bitcoin. Know. Man. But it's funny though because I came out that article and they're like, oh wow, you know, we want to shill it. You know, we want to. So I was like, no, it basically says how to get around bottle pays controls. And I was like, oh, okay, we probably shouldn't publish that. And I was like, yeah. What went wrong with bottle pay? <laughs> I think they had a good product in Europe, to be fair. I, yeah. I loved I loved it. It was a small team, like a small developer team. That's why I was so impressed by it at the time. Um, <clears throat> it got acquired by Nidig, and then I just I, it got acquired after I left. Um, I just I guess they didn't pick up the users they wanted to pick up. They got acquired. Nidig probably wanted to use them for a specific thing, and it just didn't work out. So it's all speculation at that yeah. point, but I, I maybe it just didn't get enough traction to make sense. Maybe they tried to incorporate some B2B kind of stuff, and that didn't work out. They're probably still using the team in some way, Yeah. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure what. They do a lot of good Bitcoin and Lightning stuff in this space, so they're hopefully they're trying to you know maybe utilize that technology in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I like the product bottle pay, and mm -hmm. Uh, I like Nidig. I like what they're doing with Wolf. 
Yeah. Um, I think that's a very cool kind of, it's an accelerator program, yeah. but I think it's very cool. I like Kelly who runs it. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. I, I forget what that means. We got an offer to join Wolf right before we started. So we uh -huh. decided to go with 1031 as our kind of main VC and kind of let them bootstrap. They pretty much said, hey, we'll match the same deal. But I was like, well, you know, I, Nidig is great. The new accelerator seems awesome. Evan went through it. A lot of people in this space I respect went through it, had good things to say about it. But from our perspective, it's like, well, no one's more aligned with our mission than 1031 and Matt O'Dell and all of them. So we just raised from them and a few other angels and just said, okay, this this feels comfortable. This is the right move. Yeah, good move. I mean, we had Grant and Marty on to talk about 1031. I've been talking to Grant for quite some time. Uh, I think, again, what an amazing, like, fun to have behind you and what an amazing group of people. Yeah, and always great feedback from them, too. Yeah. Um, all right, cool, man. Well, let's um, – I say we're going to talk about Mutiny. We should have a play with it. Firstly, cool name as well. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so the background to Mutiny is the fact that you wanted to get around a lot of the privacy issues. So explain what these privacy issues are that you wanted to get around. Yeah, one of the big ones is receiver privacy. So like, you know, sending on Lightning is pretty great. In fact, like I've, I've been kind of saying more and more lately that we did build sort of a Tor network on top of Bitcoin. Like the way that onion routed payments work in Lightning, you know, you go from hop to hop to hop. There's a bunch of nodes on the network. There's, I, I think, tens of thousands of nodes at this point, like 70,000 channels. So like different hops you can go through. So we basically built Tor on Bitcoin um, with that. But there's still a lot of gotchas along the way. So I think one of the big inspirations of like writing that was also like, you know, hearing Matt O'Dell on Citadel Dispatch, like, oh yeah, Lightning's pretty private. And I was like, well, there's a lot of gotchas. You can't just say, you know, hand wave over it and say, you know, there's, you know, Lightning is a privacy tool. So one of the big ones is receiver privacy. Like when you show someone your invoice, they see, the sender sees who you are as a destina destination node. And what that essentially means is your node pub key is, is shown to that sender. Uh, if you know anything about Bitcoin privacy, like if you, you're not supposed to reuse addresses anymore. That's been like a, a big no-no essentially in this space where, you know, once you do that, you can see all the transactions going in and out. You can associate it with an identity. Um, Lightning pretty much has that same problem. They reintroduced it with node pub keys. You spin up an LND node on your umbral and that's going to have the same pub key um, through its entire life. And so as people are sending to it, um, if you're going from a custodian to your pub key, like let's say you're sending from, you know, and, and I will say I love Strike, but I just use them as an example. You, they are a KYC institution. So you send from Strike to your node pub key. Um, and if you keep doing that, let's say it looks like it's just redrawing over and over again to that node. Well, they essentially can tie a social security number to a node because they see that destination in that invoice. So that's one of the big ones with Lightning Privacy. So we, Can I ask a question on yeah. that one? So what if um, you're, yeah, because a lot of people, especially people who maybe listen to this show, uh, not everyone, but don't understand all these right. details. Right. And I've kind of positioned myself as the person yeah. who, who will take the front line of that. Um, say you're not running a node, but say you've got a wallet. So you're right. using wallet of Satoshi. Um, uh, is it the same scenario? It's a little bit different with Wallet Satoshi. And in fact, each wallet handles it a little bit differently. Um, with, with Wallet Satoshi, since they're a custodian, um, they have pretty good privacy from the outside world. It's almost like if you if you gave me an address from your exchange that you use mm -hmm. and I deposit to it, it's not going to tie. I don't see anything about that because that's that's an, ad, an address that is owned by the exchange. So it's not owned by you. It's not tied to your identity. But that custodian sees what you do afterwards. It sees that you got deposited. It knows it's associated with you as Peter. Um, while Satoshi is the same way, essentially, except that, you know, they they aren't a KYC service. Um, so they essentially just see, like, what email address you signed up with, and they can tie it. So custodians, you know, is almost a privacy solution in that way, um, where you, they, no one else sees anything about them. Um, but, of course, you know, there's, there's non-KYC custodians, and you never know how long those are going to stay around. Um, that's that's my one thing to say about Wall Satoshi. So Wall Satoshi sees it all, but they don't know your identity. Um, they see payments incoming and outgoing, um, but it does get good privacy from the outside world. So if I pay your Wall Satoshi invoice, I have no idea what happens afterwards. I can't tie anything to it. Um, with stuff like Breeze and Phoenix, um, 
they'll use an LSP. And sometimes you can get pretty good privacy when you're using a lightning service provider. So Breeze runs the, the routing node on the network and all the users are sort of hiding behind them. And that's kind of the one of the ways we design Mutiny is to like voltage is the LSP. When you pay a Mutiny user, it looks like you're just paying voltage, except it routes through in a non-custodial way to the end user. So voltage can never take the funds can never take control of the funds. Um, they're just they know who to route it to, but they don't know anything about the user besides the pub key of the node that the user is using. So it it kind of like it's almost like a VPN for Lightning. You can think of LSPs as VPNs for Lightning, where you know they can see what's going on, but the outside world doesn't. And that's strictly better than what we have today, where if they were an LSP and the outside world could see it, then everyone you know not everyone uh, the payers of the invoice can see. Um, so when I show that invoice, uh, you you can see what my node is. And if you keep paying that, you know, you can associate it with uh, my identity. Okay, so what have you done with Mutiny to get around on this? Yeah, so when we built the Voltage LSP, there, there's a project called Ellen Proxy in, in this industry. And it almost works exactly like that, where they take the invoice and they wrap it again. And so they give out another invoice back to the user. And that's what you show to everyone. So when you show that invoice as a voltage LSP, we built the voltage LSP off of like uh, off of CLN, and we built it in a way where whenever a payment is, whenever an invoice is created, it looks like it's just voltage. Well, CLN. Uh, Core Lightning. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a uh, Lightning Node implementation. Um, there's yeah, Light CLN, LND. The core mm -hmm. of our application is built off of LDK, the Lightning Development Kit that uh, that Block and Spiral kind of help fund and help develop. Um, and that's basically a toolkit to build your own Lightning Node implementation. So with Mutiny, we basically built our own Lightning Node implementation on top of this toolkit. So we're almost, uh, it allows us to customize every single app, uh, every single piece of what it means to have a Lightning Node. How good is the interoperability between these Lightning implementations? Because but I know with Bitcoin, we pretty much, we're all running core. Right. Uh, and I know different implementations are possible. I, I know there are. I mean, I, don't, I haven't really looked at it. I know Luke Dash has knots. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not going to get into an error I know nothing about. But I, you know, my limited awareness is everyone's pretty much on core. But with Lightning, it seems like we have more implementations. So how's the interoperability between them? It's it's good sometimes when it works, and it's it's pretty bad when it doesn't work. Okay. Um, so th you know they have a spec group, and they all try to they all try to meet. I think every other week to you know talk about Lightning protocol development issues, and just the fact that it like works at all. You can have you know Lightning Labs supports the LND team, Blockstream supports the CLN team for the most part, and then Spiral supports. Um, the LDK team, and there's also Eclair run by, you know, that's the what powers Phoenix, the Phoenix wallet. Um, there's there's basically those four main implementations, and interoperability can, you know, when it works, the normal scenarios, it works pretty well. But when you start getting into really advanced, cutting edge stuff, it starts to break down sometimes, and that's like one of the issues we've seen launching Mutiny is like we've seen some. LDK to CLN interoperability issues where like sometimes channels would force close when they when they shouldn't. Um, we've seen some CLN to LND issues where channels are becoming inactive for no reason. Like LND wants to bump up the fee to uh, some X amount, like the the on-chain fee, they want to bump it up 10 times what they should bump up and CLN's just like, no, what? no, the on-chain fees are low right now. Why do you want to bump it up 10 times? And they deactivate the channel. So there's, there's a lot of issues still to to work out for interoperability and one of the cool things that the way lightning implementations run they don't look at each other's code they just go by the spec and they try to just say okay as long as we're obeying the spec it should all be interoperable but it's really hard to perfect and you know they're sometimes in their own bubbles you know the cln team they're testing against test suites with other cln nodes the lnd team they're working on test suites with lnd nodes but there's not really been a project yet that has a full interoperability test amongst all the Lightning nodes. I think there's a few people trying to work on it, but we need we need more of that in the space. And you know, most people probably won't run into too many issues, but when you start doing advanced things, like we do zero conf channels, which now has protocol level support. So instead of waiting for one confirmation or six confirmations for your Lightning channel to be confirmed, um, it's just it's just zero. So it, it there's a little bit of a trust from the user's perspective, um, but there's a there's a little bit of trust 
best when you have when you have an LSP anyways. Like the Breeze LSP, they they support zero comp channels. Phoenix does as well. Pretty much every every node implementation or at least mobile wallet has support for zero conf, but interoperability, when we when we built the CLN LSP for voltage, we wanted to get interoperability for zero conf for all node implementations. And that ended up turning into like a six month effort because they weren't not everyone was ready, even though it was in the spec. Yeah, so th- that sounds like a very important project because didn't we get into a bit of a disagreement with somebody when we left the party the other night, that last conversation? I don't remember. Oh, I was chatting to some guy about something along these kind of lines, and I was saying, yeah, when we get lightning out to the normies, my friends, and you go to do a payment, it doesn't work, there's going to be little patience. Yeah. You know, communicating this is the future money and some issue it doesn't work and the, the issue is down to some kind of interoperability and they don't understand. That My friends are going to be like, it just didn't work. They're not going to be people who say, well, it didn't work because the LDK kit doesn't, they don't know, they don't understand this stuff, they don't care. So that sounds like one of those important projects that needs, almost like they need to work together and agree a way to all test so it tests the interoperability and then make sure certain things perhaps don't go live until there is interoperability. Yeah. That's just my take. No, that's the that's the number one complaint that we've gotten since we launched is, is payments aren't going out. And we, we've investigated it a lot over the last few days and the number one issue is because there's channels that the CLN node is has inactive with the LND node that shouldn't be inactive. So payments aren't going out. And that's... That's on us at the end of the day. Like, you know, when when users are using mutiny and payments aren't going out, that reflects poorly on us. Not it doesn't reflect reflect poorly on L and D or CLN. And no one, no one needs, no one should have to know any of those things, but it reflects poorly on us. And we have to, there's so many, pretty much all implementations except Eclair, I have like worked on in some way, try to fix some bug report or some issue because like it's at the end of the day, we're the application. And if some part of the network can't communicate properly, well, our users will see that as a reflection of us, not node implementations having some bugs. But does that mean you have to create a workaround for their bug or wait for their bug to be fixed? We have to create the workarounds, yeah. And and so that starts to feel like that you're creating a patchwork, which doesn't feel like you're building the cleanest code Yeah, because you're... But is that like is somebody back uh, as a background in coding and tech? Is that common practice, or are we just in this weird decentralized world? Yeah, that's common practice. In some scenarios, you can fork the code. Like so, you know, a lot. I love the work that Roy does with Breeze, and very early on, he has just been banging his head against the wall trying to get L and D to change the code in one way or another, and they didn't want to go for it. So they just em- ended up running their own implementation of L and D with like certain features turned on and off just so they can do it. But it turns into a scenario like I think Moon uh, actually runs an old version of L and D, and they they have forked it heavily. And I think they're on a pretty outdated version of L&D that they've just having to patch over and over and over again and try to catch up to the latest code. So like forking a code base, so like taking the code, cloning it over, changing it in your way, and now you're the new maintainer of L&D, like your custom L&D, like that's not an easy task to do. And it creates that patchwork, it creates the headaches. And then when you try to upgrade later to the latest code base, like then it becomes a nightmare. You're not, you know, you, you're not specialized in L&D like the Lightning Labs team is. So when you do this on your own, you you might not know what you're doing 100% of the time. You can tweak code, you can change parameters, you can do all that, but you're not going to know like some obscure bug that's been fixed in the latest version that you just have to figure out on your own. So like, the patchwork really sucks. And sometimes the implementations have to do that patchwork themselves. It's not ideal, but sometimes LND is like, well, CLN does it in this way. It's you know, The protocol doesn't define it. So now they have to do some patchwork. And LDK is coming in with the same position. They're, the, they're almost the underdogs in this story. And they're like, oh, well, LND has to do it l and does it this way and they're 90% of the network. So I guess we have to figure out the workarounds to work with L&D because they don't want to change the code in a specific way. And even if they do, that's like, what, six months down the line, maybe? Like, we don't, we don't, have, we don't have six months to wait for code updates. Mm. So we have to do that patchwork ourselves. Uh, oh. All right, talk to me about zero comps <laughs> because I had yeah. uh, I spoke to Bit Refill a while back. Um, my understanding, there was something changed with regards to zero comps which affected their business, and you're mm-hmm. going to have to remind me or can remember what that was about. I can't. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember. What was um, the thing the that Barry changed? Phil and Moon. So you can now 
do RBF on zero comp transactions. Yeah. So you can replace the uh, that's fee. It. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, it, what it, actually for non RBF. So it used to be if you signal a flag, then that's you it. can always replace it. They've changed the default, haven't they? They changed it. And they didn't change the default. They allowed the option in Bitcoin Core so that any transaction could be broadcasted across the network to, you know, change the change the transaction, even if it's not explicitly saying I signal RBF. So what we had were merchants saying, oh, well, if they didn't flag RBF, that means that the tra- transaction is pretty much going to confirm. They don't know it for a fact, but they know with a high degree of certainty that no node on the network, no Bitcoin node, no Bitcoin core node would relay those transactions. And the risk rate was so low. It was so low. Yeah. So, you know, and it worked for merchants. It worked for them for a while. I think what spurred up the controversy is uh, Moon Wallet operates heavily on zero comp transactions for both opening it to the user and for the user opening it to them. So there's a lot of degree where Moon trusts their user a lot because they're trusting that the user is not going to double spend. And they had a pretty good success rate uh, because of the non the RBF rule. But since that became allowable on the network, like, I mean, especially in high fee rate environments, like I know that they lost a lot of money from users that were being malicious and for bugs on the network. Like, oh, that zero comp transaction never confirmed and it it got pushed out of the, you know, it never confirmed. It's been weeks and it's no longer in the mempool. And the, the fee went back to the user after they already made a lightning payment. Huh. So, well, they, so was there a way to essentially just scam them over and over with it? They, because Moon is trying to give users an instant experience. So, so it's Moon is not a Lightning wallet. It's just yeah. all on chain. So, when you as a user want to pay a Lightning invoice, you expect that to be instant, because that's what Lightning is all supposed to be about. So, it's actually two transactions on chain, two on chain transactions every time you do a payment on Moon, and they trust that the user is not going to double spend it, and they go ahead and spend that. They pay that Lightning invoice on behalf of the user. So, I had a friend that had. You know, he was just bouncing money between multiple wallets because he was testing, and he ended up getting like a thousand dollars back refunded on Moon, even though it arrived to his Phoenix wallet. That's, I mean, it's great of Moon to try that. So I always wondered how Moon did that. Yeah, I I was like, how? What's going on here? I like, how are you doing Lightning payments for me and on chain in the same one? I just didn't know. Yeah. So so what are they doing? Are they they're paying it for you? Then did are they commingling the funds? Not commingling. They just. Because they've still got to take, if they're paying the lightning fee for you, right. they've still got to take the Bitcoin from an on-chain address, which means there's an on-chain payment, but that on-chain payment is going to be much higher than a lightning payment. So how, how right. are they covering that? The, sometimes it shows up as a huge fee when there's huge high fee environments. I've seen some screenshots from Moon users that said they paid a $50 lightning fee. Oh, shit. Or sorry, a $50 Moon fee um, to pay for coffee. Um, and like normal lightning, it shouldn't have that scenario. You pay for a coffee; it's a five dollar transaction. It should, it should, it's, yeah, it should be pennies on the dollar if you're doing real lightning. But in high fee environments, Moon just doesn't work. So they expect it's a, it's a they're trying to do atomic swaps that aren't actually atomic because it's zero conf and you can undo the first part of it. So with an atomic swap, it basically means I I give a I spend a transaction to the service provider. Um, they won't pay the invoice until it, it locks itself into a two of two with the service provider. So a two of two multi-sig, um, neither one can spend it unilaterally. But once Moon pays the invoice, they're supposed to redeem the. Tr- they are supposed to be able to redeem the transaction to their own wallet. So it's like a two-step process. And if it's done atomically, there should be no issues with with. I, I pay that invoice and I oh now I can't redeem the funds from the user. You should always be able to redeem the funds from the user with an atomic swap. But since they're doing zero conf, they're just like, oh yeah, well, it'll it'll confirm and then it, it never confirms. And but they already paid the invoice and now they're out whatever much. So there's huge liquidity constraints or sorry, liquidity requirements on Moon side to keep enough funds on Lightning and enough funds on chain to be able to support users going back and forth between on chain and Lightning. Like I mean, 
I have to applaud Moon. Like they kill it with the UX. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of trust in the user with it. And and you could get in that scenario where you're 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 bleeding money because of some of these assumptions. Is is there anything that Moon's doing where you're putting uh trust in not being rugged by them? Yeah. So it goes kind of both ways. So yeah. when Moon opens when Moon sends you the on-chain transactions, um, you know, when you show a moon invoice it's lightning right but again on your moon wallet you only understand on chain so it, it works in the reverse as well if that transaction never confirmed um you essentially said i redeem the payment and then the transaction never confirmed and then they could they could rug you that way as well so they're not doing it maliciously yeah. it's all from like zero conf issues if in high fee environments where like transactions could be bumped um it just happens accidentally like it's just not it's just not anyone's fault except for trusting zero comp so we kind of have a little bit of that of that as well if you you don't have to set an lsp in mutiny you can just open up your own channel with any node on the network but if you set the voltage lsp as your lsp um you are assuming that voltage will send you those funds or that that turns out that channel will confirm and then the sun's funds will be sent over they're good guys, and yeah. I, I love what they've done with the UX. But um, that's just some of the growing pains that that you get with doing it that way. And, and I think they want to change it. I just they didn't they didn't change it by the time we had the latest high fee spikes a few months back. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they continue with that. Uh, I mean, I just love the UX anyway. Yeah. It, it's a great wallet. I, it's a funny one with um, like on chain. I I don't operate with multiple wallets. But with uh, Lightning, I do. I just have a range of wallets. I, I really like John Carvalho's wallet. He's just launched. Um, obviously, we like what you, you're doing. Um, I really like Blue's Lightning wallet. I know they've got rid of it. Yeah, they're going away. Such a shame. That was custodial. Yeah, custodial. but I, I was okay with that. Right. I, mean, I never kept much in it. Yeah. Um, but there's so many good wallets. I, like it, It's unbelievable how many good wallets are out there. Okay, anyway, look. Back to back to Mutiny. So that's the first thing you've done. What else have you been doing to get away from or to deal with privacy? Yeah. One thing that we're doing behind the scenes is allowing multiple nodes to spin up. So because we're built on LDK, we kind of get this toolkit to spin up multiple nodes really quickly and really efficiently. One of the products that we haven't shipped yet, we did it at a, another hackathon that Lisa threw. Like Lisa throws the best hackathons, the best events, the best education events in the space. Um, we came up with a project where it's, I'm calling it Redshift. It's basically a lightning based coin swap and so chris belcher came up with this coin swap uh protocol a while back um i don't know if he's done any work on it recently or, or that he's finished it but it's essentially is like i send a utxo to you and you send one back but there's no correlation between the two it just shows up on chain like i have a new utxo you have a new utxo and that just essentially means you know for, from a from a privacy perspective it erases all previous links all previous history that you had on that transaction so you spend that transaction you get you get a new one from someone else and you you attach you get you inherit their history of transactions instead of the one you had which some people don't like that because you know they don't know what they're going to be essentially buying. Yeah, you know it, it could end up backfiring. Where like like with coin joins, you you all put your funds together. It all you know you're not supposed to know link the inputs to the output, so everything should be uniform. It should just be oh we're all treated equally. We're all the same. We all inherited each other's history, which is you know indistinguishable. You know it, it basically you know, erases that history from that standpoint. But from a coin swap perspective, you get, you inherit someone else's history. It's not obvious that it was a coin swap, um, which is kind of a cool thing. It just looks like you did a normal transaction and it just went, went one hop, you know, went one hop away. Because some services will reject coin swaps when they know what they are. Uh, they'll, they'll reject uh, coin joins. Yes. Coin joins. Yeah. yeah. So is that why, is that the incentive to create what you've created? Yeah. So with, with uh, coin swap, in general, that was the incentive. Um, we thought we could do coin swaps without needing to do some of the hardcore cryptography that Chris Belcher was doing. We essentially are treating Lightning as the sort of contract layer for for this transaction. So we we will spin up a new pub key on the on the same user's device, 
we open a channel with some random node on the network. We push the funds all the way through. It gets to the Voltage LSP. Voltage will open a channel with you with one of their UTXOs. And then when you're done, you just close the channel. So we do that all behind the scenes. So what it looks like to the user is I have a UTXO. I want a coin shift. Wait, you know, wait for some confirmations to happen. Wait for some channel opens to happen. And then what you'll have is a new UTXO at the very end. Um, it essentially is coin swapping with voltage. Okay. And uh, again, we're going to have to go to my base level understanding. Right, right, right. Does that mean you have to find somebody with the same value UTXO who wants to do the swap? No. So in this case, you just push as much funds as you can. Okay. Right. And then when you close that channel, it'll just be whatever amount ended up confirming. Like you, you could get in a scenario where I open the channel with a random node. I, I try to push it through the network and, you know, there wasn't enough liquidity and like, you know, only half of it made it. But that half that made it, you still get half a new UTXO. And and when you close it on the original one, you'll you'll have that half back. It's almost like, you know, toxic change on whatever's left over. Um, you know, those funds didn't, didn't make it through because there may have been liquidity issues, payment failures, whatever. Um, but whatever amount will end up getting back to your new node, which is still on your same wallet. It's just spinning up new nodes under the scene to do, it's almost like going back in a circle, paying yourself down different nodes. And there's no regulatory risk with you doing this because we know coin swap, coin joins uh, have been a, an important like move uh, push forward in privacy if we go historically when they, we used to have mixers mm -hmm. which i know is different but they were seen as something which had a, a regulatory issue with them we know people have been arrested for running right. them so there's no regulatory issue with that or you scared there's no around? custody of the funds by any other third party there but you yourself go. yeah yeah uh, you well, control both sides of it essentially so you're not even effectively a middleman in the transaction and and not even the lsp is just opening a channel to you and routing a payment like it does every other user on the lightning network so if there's regulatory Amazing. issues that means there's lightning regulatory issues in general which i you know you could argue that someone could make that argument um but that would be detrimental to lightning network and i don't yeah i don't think you could i don't think it would work I, i've been Love talking it. to some companies in the space that are operating major LSPs um, from, I, I won't name who, but they pretty much got high top executive lawyers to kind of say like, oh, running a LSP is, you know, it's fine. There's no MTLs needed. There's no MSBs needed. It's just, you know, it's all non-custodial at the end of the day. So you would have to ban Lightning to ban a Lightning-based coin swap. It, it is it is brilliant the this kind of like fundamental approach to decentralization that has existed since the start of bitcoin which gets around so many issues uh with regulators uh whether it's related like like you said there to you know, man, money transmission licenses or anything to do with the sec where they want to sue anyone right it's absolutely brilliant i love it i think we should i th oh let's talk about uh also your web-based yeah. Let's talk about the fucking massive benefits of that. Yeah. It's so it's web based. And, you know, some people have called us crazy from the very start for doing it. Some people are calling us crazy right now for doing it. We can, we can get into the, definitely get into the trade offs of it as well, too. Um, but yeah, we're web based. We, we, we run it all. We write it all in Rust, all the node logic uh, or programming language called Rust. Um, then we compile that to WebAssembly and then we ship that to the user's device. Um, so effectively, all the node logic runs right there on the on the user's phone in the web tab. You can you can run it on a desktop in Safari, Firefox, Chrome. Um, same thing on Safari mobile on iOS, and then Chrome, Android as well. Firefox, Android, it works there as well. So essentially, you go to app.mutinywallet.com, and then a new node spins up fresh from the start like we we've thought about like okay how do we like onboard the users how do we like explain what's going on and for now we're just sort of saying like here's a little pop-up this is careful this is still beta um but there we go there we go you you click the x and and you see that you have zero sats and you're ready to start receiving all like, right so anyone listening by the way if you want to go to youtube we, we actually have it live on the screen if you don't and we'll try and talk you through best what we're seeing here. Uh, Dev-wise, what additional challenges did you face doing it web-based, or is it easier? 
It's so hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, the Rust WebAssembly ecosystem is getting a lot better, but there's still challenges. For one, everything runs single-threaded, so uh, you don't get a lot of performance benefits from being multi-threaded. Um, for another, yes, yeah, it's just thread, like a weird thread, death Come thing. on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another is talking to the Lightning Network is a challenge. So we have to run a communication proxy in order for, anyone can run it. You can self-host it. We have the code on GitHub. It's all MIT source code. Um, you can run your own proxy on your own Umbral, but essentially is web browsers can't talk TCP. Um, so there's a native internet protocol on uh, to any other network. You you can only do HTTP requests. It gets It gets a little weird, but Essentially, it can't natively talk to the Lightning Network, so we had to build some tooling around it to allow to, you know, you have some central point that you can talk to the rest of the network. And and all the messages are going back and forth, are encrypted to the node you're talking to, so there's no, you know, man-in-the-middle attacks there. There's no, you know, decrypting it and seeing what you're saying. Um, you can even use that as just a normal proxy because, you know, no application can talk to a normal protocol like LND or sorry, like lightning or, or anything like that. So it's just, it gets in the weeds there. Um, I mean, but also, you know, the, the security isn't as good as well. I will admit that, you know, it's not, you know, we're treating this as like a hot spending wallet, like, like, you can onboard like your waitress, you know, put 20 sat, you know, or $20 worth of sats as a tip to your waitress or um, get someone onboarded really easily and they can progress from there. Um, don't put your life savings on there. We've had some people put way too much on there and, and had some issues and we're like, okay, this was like, this was like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Like, we're, like we warn you, don't put too much money on here. And the first thing users do is put thousands of dollars of sats on there and they ran into some weird issue. But there, there is a different scenario that happens as well. So uh, I got my first blue wallet in around, I'm going to say, let's say 2020, start of 2020. I can't remember exactly. And I had like two, $300 that went up to say $400 with right. inbound. Bull run happens. I have $4,000 in there. So you can a bull run can just drive up the value of your wallet. Right. I mean, the amount of uh, you know during the next bull run, the, the amount of uh, dollar value of sets you're holding in there could five x, ten x. Yeah, yeah. We 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 have warnings around amounts now. So if you try to do too much, we say don't don't do don't this. Don't do that. Um, but yeah, also on the inverse side, we haven't run into it yet. But yeah, once you have collected enough sats, um, you know we should probably have a prompt that's like, hey, put this to cold storage. Put this in like some other app. Keep a little bit on here for your spending, walking around money. We have, we're going to come out with a lot of like social based Nostra features. We're going to come out with some cool things that I think make us pretty unique. But in general, yeah, it's it like treat it as a spending wallet. Um, everything is encrypted to your seed words as well. So if you have your seed words, you can, you can, you can destroy the wallet. You can clear your browser's history and cache and everything like that and recover from the same 12 words. It'll, it'll recover your channels. It'll recover your, um, um, on-chain balances, you can you can load up your on-chain balance in a different wallet. Like that's all interoperable. Dangerously so, paced from Clipboard. <laughs> Love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Clipboard isn't isn't the safest either. Uh, of course, I have, I, the first thing I see Odell do is say, "Oh, dangerously clip." You know. Copy to clipboard. I love that. And he clicked it. <laughs> um, I did see you getting a little bit of shit around this because obviously putting your seed words into a web browser is right. never normally a good idea. Yeah. And 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 you shouldn't use it from like a fresh wall. The only reason this is there is if you're restore if you're restoring your other mutiny wallet. Like if you deleted your browser history and you yeah. need to restore it again. Like 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 again, if if you're using it just for a spending wallet and you only have a little bit on here, when you're restoring your seed words here, it should just be your previous state that should only be a little bit. Um, of course, it is not a good practice to be doing that um, and just walking around doing it. But I don't know. It's it's a, it's a hard one. We we want people to be able to restore yeah. from the same user interface that that they're using. Um, but no, you shouldn't you shouldn't go and stick your cold card seed words into the browser. No, like it 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 already spins up one by default. If you if you click on like the backup screen, I definitely don't show the seed words, but it will it won't well, show it by default. Yeah. But it'll it'll ask you, hey, back up. Um, and and that's what that that's what you should back up. So it creates some seed words on the client device by default once you spin it up for the first time. So so it's it's pretty good working from your cache, but uh if you uh, created the wallet in incognito mode, mm. say you were using incognito mode, surfing the web, and then created the wallet, 
you would have an issue there. Yeah, so it would be a different wallet. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and some incognito browsers will cut off access to storage at all. Um, not even like temporary. Like like one of the things we want to be able to do is allow like Tor browser users to spin up a wallet, use it for their instance that they're using it, and then throw it away. Like it's like if you want to set up a new Lightning wallet today, and you already have an you already have an umbrella with L and D on it. Like how easy is it to get another umbrella with L and D on it? Like it's, it's a whole pain in the ass process. So like we've essentially made it super easy to just. Spin up a node just like that. Um, use it for single time use if you want to, and then throw it away. Like a digital open dime. Basically, yeah. yeah and so, like, cool. but the Tor browser doesn't allow any access to even the temporary storage. Um, so we have some issues around that, and we can't. Uh, we, we we'll have to do like an in memory only option for like Tor browser. So it's like we'll have to pop open the warning like, hey. Nothing is going to be saved. Once you close this tab, it is gone forever. But I could totally see some users wanting to quickly spin something up and, and do it. So what, what is the long-term role of mutiny? Is it a just a is it like my wallet in my pocket? Yeah, I, I think it works well, a wallet in your pocket. Also a desktop too. I find myself wanting a desktop wallet um, as well sometimes. Um, I really like being able to bounce between the two. So some users are using uh, the same browser. They they load it up on their phone and then they're like, oh, this is so cool. Let me load it up on my desktop. And they and then like channels will close because you have two nodes running at the same time um, with the same seed words. And we've had forced closure issues from that. So like we have to communicate to users, hey, you can you can have this on multiple devices, just don't use them at the same time, uh, or else there could be you know channel closures and and uh, some issues around that. But but are um, these channels you're opening for them? These are the channels that the users are either opening themselves or they sent a Lightning payment and the LSP opened to them right? Um, as well. So th what will typically happen is just the channel will close, you'll get the funds back on chain, and and that'll be it. So you have you, you sent to this, Danny? Yep, I've okay. just sent to and it. And then... Uh... A lightning setup fee of ten thousand cents. Is that your? Is that your monetizing? No, that's that's the LSP. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we we don't even operate the LSP. Um, all right, it worked. Boom. A channel was open, and you received uh, forty five thousand sets. So you, and then cool. you can you can send that out, and and you have like we want to make it that easy to onboard someone to lightning for the first time in a non custodial context. Now, sure, until the channel is confirmed, technically, like voltage could. You know, double spend the on-chain transaction. Yeah. Um, but like, if that starts happening, like, then there's a lot of like trust issues with the LSP, and then you would switch. We want to get to the point where any Lightning node on the network could be an LSP for anyone else. That's okay. that's the dream. So if you don't want to trust Voltage, if you trust your uncle Jim, um, and he's running the LSP for your family in a non-custodial context you know you're still a little bit trusted but in non-custodial context you can pick whoever like all you need to do to be an lsp in my opinion is have an always online node that has good liquidity and there's tons of nodes on the network that would meet that requirement um it's just we haven't built out that yet and there's some open lsp specs going on you know breeze from roy a lot of a lot of liquidity providers a lot of wallets are in on those conversations but i think that some of that is still you know, six or so months away. Um, Evan just is launching his LSP with with Zeus, Zeus and we're yeah. talking to him about putting in an option into our wallet where it says, okay, do you want to use the Voltage LSP or you want to use Evan's LSP? So at least get multiple choices. It's not going to be a one-for-one. -one. You can just swap out any pub key with anyone else. It's still, we're going to have to hard code some things to get it to work with with Zeus um, in the beginning. But we our dream is that anyone can be an LSP. You don't have to trust anyone else. You don't, you can even say like, no, I don't want a just-in-time channel. Like I'm going to wait one confirmation before I reveal the pre-image um, to to the node to the Lightning Network. So you could do it in a way where it's it's a lot less trusted yeah. by just saying like I'll wait one confirmation, and then I'll consider the channel active. It's, it reminds me. I know it's obviously a, com a completely different, but it's a little bit like Cashew that um, mm -hmm. like in terms of how you actually use it. 
Um, and I was really impressed with how simple that is. And that's obviously never been done with Lightning before. So it's very cool. The Fediment stuff, the eCash stuff is going to be huge, I think, for the Lightning mm. Network. And mm. one of the things that we're, we haven't, we haven't done it yet. We're still waiting for some of the eCash stuff to, to get a lot better. Um, it's, it's, it's going a long way. It's coming a long way. But one of the dreams is, so when you made that deposit, you noticed that there were minimum requirements. So yep. we require their 50K. 50K sats for the first inbound, for the first channel to be open because it doesn't make sense to open a channel to you for like like 500 sats a thousand sats like the on-chain fees are too high for that like you wouldn't want to do that so we want a mode for if your very first deposit is under 50k sats it goes into a fediment that would be very cool. Uh, and then once you have enough money in that fediment, maybe you never do. Maybe you, it's the waitress and she throws away the wall and doesn't care about Bitcoin ever again. But say you have a user that gets enough sats, starts learning about Bitcoin. It's the same wallet, same user experience. They see they have Lightning sats that's just in a fediment, it's, but it, it's still interoperable with Lightning. Once they get enough sats, they're like, hey, do you want to be non-custodial now? You have enough to open your very first Lightning channel, and then you're not trusting the federation or the e uh, or the um, uh, the cashew provider for that. So we want to we want to be able to do that, but so it would almost be good bit. to have like a simple mode for that. So you could instead of seeing like Sats and Base Chain, you just saw your balance, and maybe that balance you could even say just be in dollars, and then you can go into like the more complex mode where you see where those Sats are actually held. You yeah. know, if you're trying to onboard like waitresses. Yep. I think the, the more simple you can make it, the better. The unified balance experience is something we want to do. I think we we made an interesting trade off for this. Um, we we talked a lot about it. Like if you use Moon or Phoenix or Breeze right now, it just shows you a single balance, and yeah. you can do on chain with both of them. Um, they make some trade offs in order to do it. Moon is an on chain wallet by default. That was their trade off. Phoenix, it's technically custodial when you do anything on chain. Um, at least temporarily custodial. At least it passes through them. They do on-chain stuff on your behalf. So, I mean, they're they're operating not in the U.S. Then they're operating in some other countries. So maybe they they can get away with that. Um, but in this scenario, we're like we, we don't want those trade-offs right now. And, yeah. But when we get splicing, that's when we're going to unify it, and it's just going to show one balance because splicing is a huge improvement for the Lightning Network, and it's going to get around all all of these like weird issues where you're operating as on chain, but you can still do Lightning, or you're operating as Lightning and you can still do on chain. Like, there's a lot of headaches around that. Danny, can you just go to the receive page? Okay, so you've got uh, receive, uh, and then go you know, get rid of that. So I hadn't even noticed this. Um, so you've got base chain on here. Yeah. So how do I send to base? Because usually you choose whether to send to a base chain address or a line right. address. How do you populate the base chain address here? Yeah. So put in put in some amount for that, and then uh, set that amount, and then hit continue. Um, we spin up a unified QR code. So BIP21 unified ah, QR so code. It doesn't matter what. So if I send from base chain, it goes to base chain. If I send from yep. Lightning, it goes to Lightning. And it's up to the sender what they can do. You can click, if you say at the bottom, it says choose format. If you wanted it to specifically be Lightning or on chain, you have that choice. Um, but with unified, it just makes that UX a little bit easier and it allows the sender to decide how they pay you. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and in a wallet, but in a wallet where you don't really want people to have too much in there, to have base chain is kind of kind of interesting yeah that's true um we we figured if you still want to use mutiny for both you know you can still keep a hundred or two hundred dollars worth of on chain on there what when what i'm excited about is to be able to add uh cold storage integrations as well so you can put you can actually plug in a cold card to your phone and you can pass BSBTs around that way. So you could have Mutiny up on your phone or on your desktop, and you say, I want to sign a transaction, but it's only cold storage. Like we don't have any on chain funds at hot risk. Like there's no on chain private keys on there. We could have a mode like that. And then you plug in your cold card, it creates the PSBT, you sign it with the cold card, and you pass it back, and then boom, it makes an on chain transaction. So you could effectively have like, you could have, you know, a million, two million sats on your mutiny wallet, most of it on chain, but the on chain part's protected by your cold card. So even if something were to happen or someone took your device, you know, that would that would be fine. And only the lightning funds would be at risk. So you can keep topping up that way from cold storage to lightning just whenever you need to. Can you move your base chain sats into your lightning wallet? Yeah. Here? Okay, sometimes I have to confess things I've never done. I've never done the reverse. I've never, in my history of Bitcoin, sent lightning sats back to a base chain. Mm -hmm. Just never 
you know, Blue Wallet didn't have it. Mm. And so is that easy to do? We we can do it here if we, we don't expose it to the user because mo- most people, like, once you're onboarded to Lightning, you, yeah. you, you want to stay there unless you absolutely have to make the on-chain transaction. And then you probably have another wallet you can do that with. Um, with this, you can close the channel. And then, but you effectively, like in one one opinion, you you paid 10k sats to get the channel open to you. Some of that went to the on-chain fee. Um, you're already set up. So like ideally, you don't have to go from lightning to on-chain. And splicing will make sure that you never have to do that. And with your uh lightning wallet there, you only have one channel open. Uh if another one comes in, so let's say you made an invoice for so when Voltage opens up a channel to you, they're not just opening it up for 50K sats or 60K sats. They're giving you a little bit of buffer as well. So you can start receiving more right now, up to 100K more without needing another channel. So you don't pay another 10K. You can receive up to 1,000, 100,000 more right now without paying another 10K sats. That's cool. um, but if you, if, it, if you cross that threshold, then Voltage will just charge you another 10K sats for another channel. And you'll have two channels to you. And in in that ten k sats, are they? Is that covering the full fee? Or yeah. Why is it not a variable fee? It should be. Um, we haven't built that part at the LSP level to change yeah. it. So Voltage can change it manually, and then so if it's a lower fee environment, it should be it should be configurable um, on the fly. But we haven't built that part yet. So right now we're just estimating on chain fees. Stipulate it should be it should pay for a little bit of that, and then it should pay a little bit more for Voltage for providing that service to you. All right. Can, let me ask you a question that's been with me and Danny for a while. Yeah. I still haven't f- fully figured out. Uh, my base chain Bitcoin, my cold storage Bitcoin, uh, I am completely self-sovereign. Um, we just had two of them before you, and we were talking about like the future of Bitcoin, hyper-Bitcoinization. It might be like 10 grand to send, at one, at one point, to send an on-chain fee. So some people might never be able to get on-chain. If that is the case, can you be self-sovereign on the Lightning Network, or are you always using a, prov- a provider, and therefore, is any provider really a bank to you? Yeah. No one's ever given me a really good answer to this question, and I feel like, are we, are we ignoring? Is this like the, an elephant in the room? It all has to fall back on chain at some point yes. for you to be completely self-sovereign. So with Lightning, if, if, there, if one party goes away, you close the channel, it falls back on chain to you. Um, this feels like a big Bitcoin elephant in the room. Yeah. In that we are encouraging a world of being self-sovereign right. and trying to get as many people onto Bitcoin as possible. But in a post-hyper-Bitcoinized world, where where on chain uh, transaction is ten thousand, it might be that it might be a thousand dollars. Even at much much lower uh, levels, you're going to want to spend most of your time on Lightning, right? Are we? Are, do we need to have like an honest conversation about this and say the future of Bitcoin is that most people won't be self sovereign, and therefore, like, what are we really creating here? Right. I, I think solutions like ARC could be interesting where, and I don't know all the details about ARC, um, but it's just an alternative payment channel network that doesn't have some of the problems Lightning has. It has it has other problems, but I think worlds where there are fediments and, and maybe it's maybe the exact scenario where I said, okay, you know, you're on, you're in a fediment and then once you got enough, it could be a scenario where it's like, okay, once you got ten thousand dollars so you can make an on chain payment, now you can now you can self sovereign open a lighting channel. Yeah, but you don't want to spend the whole ten thousand dollars you've got. Right. Oh yeah, you don't want to spend that <laughs> yeah. fee. Yeah, so it would be yeah. more like a hundred thousand dollars to be to be self sovereign. And if even at that been, point, yeah. And then why would you want to spend ten k for for that unless mm. you were at risk? I, I I think, I I think when fees are that high, it's there's a lot of things that will break. And but hopefully new things will be invented. Right. You never know. There might be yeah, and things. art could be one of those new things that have. So with with art, you could have a scenario where the transactions. They do it in a way where they're spending the on-chain transactions, but you can always fall back on chain. But I don't know. It, every, every, everything breaks if you can't go back on chain. Yeah, my assumption is that we, we what we end up in a place is that there are service providers that are like banks in the future, but they have just a very different trust model from a right. bank. In that, and federations would be perfect for that. Exactly. Yeah, but it's just it feels like it's a bit of an elephant in the room that that we've avoided talking about. Yeah, when we get to super high fee environments, but 
Okay, we can worry about that for the future. We're, right. we're early enough. We should be okay. Um, <laughs> but it sucks even paying like $10 for an on-chain transaction. Like, dude, yeah, I hate that. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the rug model because mm-hmm. um, that was another thing that came up uh, at uh, in Nashville uh, during the Lightning Conference. One of the downsides of this is that uh, – because you're not app based, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, people you, you you could rug people. Look, I know you, I know Ben. You're, you're yeah. not that character, but it's still part of a risk model. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything you can do to mitigate that in terms of the way you uh, update the code? Can the can people have something there end to check the code hasn't been updated? Is, what can you do yeah. on that? I think with it as well, you should explain how it was would be possible. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would love to. Um, for one. Because we're not app based, we can actually push up a code change in five minutes, um, which gives us, which on the reverse side, it, it comes nice for development because we can push up a hot fix instantly. We're not waiting on Apple to approve it. We're not waiting on Google to approve it. We can push or it them up to instantly. fuck you the way they've just tried yeah. to fuck Nostar. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes they sometimes they'll catch some old issue that they didn't catch before, and they said, "Oh, you can have an unrelated update that has nothing to do about." whatever feature they have a problem with. And they say, oh, well, we caught this one thing we didn't catch before. Now you can't update your app until you get rid of that. And it's like, well, okay, now I can't update a fix. Um, so we can we can push up really fast. Um, but that also means, yeah, we could push up something that like takes, takes the hot wallet funds that are on there. Um, for the most part, apps still have that problem as well. How many people have auto updates turned on in, in the App Store, the Google App Store, the Apple App Store? They, they may have updates turned on automatically. It's just, it's just a two-day turnaround instead of a five-minute turnaround, but they can still push up an update. Like, you know, Blue Wallet could push up an update if they wanted to to iOS Store. There is no verification on the iOS wallet that you get from the App Store. Now, on Android, you can, like, do things like check the APK. You can check the binaries. You can you can compare hashes. You can try to reproduce the build. On iOS, you get none of that. If you download any app from the iOS Store, you're effectively downloading the, You're effectively trusting the developers and Apple. Right, okay. Both. So there's, there's still some that that exists especially for ios users but it's still uh applicable here um there's there's a lot of web related hacks in general that can happen dns level attacks like core pro you know web protocol stuff that could happen with this that you don't get when you're running a binary on your app store it, it, it in one scenario um we could do so it's a progressive web app which means, and a lot of, especially iOS users, iOS doesn't expose this to many, many users, but you can like hit the share button on it, on some websites and, and install to home screen. So it almost looks like an application. So that mm-hmm. way, that way, you know, if someone makes a malicious domain, that's like mutiny wallet with two T's, you know, dot com. Like you won't run into that problem because it, it caches the code on the phone and you have that. And we can even add, we haven't done it yet, but we can add a button that says in, in the code, or sorry, in the front end on the home screen, we can say like, oh, there's a new version of this wallet. And so it can download the new version whenever you want it to download. So there's a little bit of caching and, you know, asking the user if they want to download a new version that we can do. Um, we haven't done some of that yet, but we, you know, we'll, we'll probably want to once we figure that part out. Um, for now, we're wanting um, you know, quicker updates. There can be issues around caching where it turns into a nightmare where it, it doesn't ever update for like a day or two and users are like, hey, what this new feature, this new bug fix is not working. And it's like, okay, well, clear your cache. Oh, well, if you clear your cache, you might clear your browser. Yeah. And then like, you know, mm-hmm. you don't want to run into that. So we we have to figure out the UX around cacheable PWAs, but we can have a button that says, do you want to update? Um, and that, that'll help a little bit. Another thing is we could have like third-party watchers. So I know NVK runs something called like binarywatch.com or binarywatch. Um, where He's got it, every domain in he the got world. Every, yeah, yeah. It's, it's got to be, <laughs> it, it's a simple domain. It's got to be something like that. He gets the OG domains. Um, we can have something where some third party is pulling down the code and making sure that it has, like if it has been updated, maybe we can do something where we're signing our releases and we're signing the updates. Like on the web, it's a lot harder to do some of the binary verification stuff that we get with like Bitcoin Core and Sparrow and some Android wallets. So, you know, it's always interesting. I think Bitcoiners pushed the boundaries on how we can get reproducible builds. Like, I don't think people were doing reproducible builds 10, 
15 years ago. I think Bitcoiners pushed the boundaries on like, okay, what does it mean to like sign binaries with your PGP key? What does it mean? Like, how do we make sure every single build looks exactly the same no matter how you do it? I think Bitcoiners push the ball on that. I could, I think we could probably push the ball on what we can verify in a web context. Um, I, it's it's going to be a lot harder, I think, but and we're going to have to be really creative. But I mean, we put a node in a fucking browser. I think we can be <laughs> yeah. a little creative on what we can do. <laughs> so the I, the big one I've heard as well is like obviously phishing, like you said, mm-hmm. use new yeah. two T's or whatever. Yeah. Uh, presumably, there's nothing you can really do in terms of like what the user actually sees to know you're on the correct web page because yeah. they could just copy anything, right? Yeah, I mean, someone could literally download the source code and throw it up in any domain. But because of that, you can self-host it as well. So we we want we haven't done it yet, but we want to be able to integrate with Umbral and Start9 so you can have like peterwallet.com. Okay. And and you're self-hosting it and you decide when you update. And you know, we can we could probably build it. I, I haven't used Umbral in a while, but we could probably build it where there's an update button in Umbral and you decide whenever you want to update and That's use cool. it. So you could self-host your own domain and do it yourself. It feels to me it's it's that kind of almost typical uh, risk model whereby your risk model is similar to carrying a physical wallet with $200 in, about, right. about the same kind of risk yeah. that you want for the same kind of money. By the way, Danny, I noticed you're in private browsing, so you're going to have to... Uh, Oh, that's all right. I did that on purpose because I've already got back, one open. You're going to have to back up your... I was going to show the private keys. That's why I did it in private, but we never got there anyway. <laughs> but you're going to have to back that up. Otherwise, you're going to lose those sets. That's okay. Yeah, I'll so, send them out. So when you have funds for the first time, we do have this warning at the very top that's like, okay, you have funds, back them up. Good old um, three and a half inch floppy disk. Yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul has done all the UI, and he's worked with uh, from Mia from uh, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet um, to to do a lot. De- definitely don't, definitely don't. I was going to do it, this. and let's see if someone can steal okay. it for okay. the show. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Tap to reveal seed words. Dude, you can move them straight after we've made the show. No, let's see who gets them first. Right. So it shows the words. Um, I've never seen Satoshi in the list of words. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I didn't know Satoshi. I've not either. I didn't know Satoshi was in the. I think the I got it one time before on a wall. Ah, yeah, that's uh, amazing. I did not know Satoshi. How many words are there? We're doing t- oh, uh, two thousand and twenty-four. Yeah, yeah, I did not know Satoshi was one. I've never seen it. Yeah. Oh my God. So we at, like we don't ask the user to back up until there's any funds on there because some of the onboarding experience, it's like, okay, you know, write all these down now, repeat them back in random orders. And it's just some, it's, it could take minutes to do the entire process. And they might not want to do that. Mm-hmm. And they might not ever use the wallet ever again. They say, oh, this is like, this is too much. I left. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, once you have funds on there at all, then we prompt you to back them up. Um, we, we ask you to write down the words. We tell you your funds are your responsibility <laughs> and that you're not lying just to get over <laughs> with it. And some users have like screenshotted that bottom part and was like, oh, you got me. Yeah. I was I was just going to click, click, click and hit continue. <gasps> I've done it. I've yeah, done it. I've done it. So <laughs> you, you, you can't get past that unless you're, uh, unless you're being truthful. All right, Danny, run through the menu. Just to make sure we've uh, covered everything down the left. I mean, we really want it to be as simple as just send and receive. Done like that. you can, you can send Bitcoin, that. you can receive Bitcoin. Um, one of the cool things, if you go to the settings, we have um, some Nostr Wallet Connect features. So we have something called Wallet Connections, and we're trying to do subscriptions on top of Lightning. Something that like Bitcoiners have never had before. Um, the way to like the way we we're going to do subscriptions uh, that works for anyone, not just not just us but you can effectively have like bit refill and you link your mutiny wallet up with bit refill so if you want to type maybe bit refill or something there um you you create a profile for a new wallet connection and what it does behind the scenes if you drop that down um you if you scan that i have the ability to request payment from you with just that, with just that code. Now you don't have to pay it. It doesn't take the funds yeah. automatically. But a little pop up will show up in the UI saying like, "Hey, do you approve uh, this payment for like ten thousand sats?" And if you remember what you were just doing, um, so if you're checking out with BitRefill and you hit that checkout button, and then a notification pops up on your phone says, "Okay, do you want to pay ten thousand sats?" and you just easily click yes. It's like a bank asking you, "Hey, do you approve this transaction for whatever amount?" That's um, very cool. You know, we can never like. Doing subscriptions in a credit card way on top of Lightning like just isn't possible. Um, so we do almost like a pull-based request system. Um, so when you open your wallet again, we ask you, hey, here's your Netflix subscription for the month. Like you can subscribe to Mutiny Plus on here and 
at the end of the month, we'll send you a notification. Hey, do you want to subscribe to Mutiny Plus again? Um, What's Mutiny Plus? Mutiny Plus. You get absolutely nothing, but you're supporting the dev team for 21K sats a month. Um, huh. So we want to put in some advanced features into our wallet to you know, actually give people access to Mutiny Plus. But we, we do want to monetize it with this wallet. Like It is FOSS. It is open source. It is MIT. Um, we are VC funded. And we do have, um, we just announced that, or OpenSAS just announced we got a grant from them. Um, we got a 150K grant from them to implement um, a lot of NASA related features and some DLC stuff over the next six months. So how do you get to the point where you are self-sufficient though? What is the monetization model long-term? Because it is a problem in Bitcoin is that uh, it's hard to make money. Yeah, it's hard to make money. And, and Danny just subscribed to Mutiny Plus. I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> well done, Whoever so steals this wallet is not subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're exploring a lot of different business models. And, and one of that is seeing, okay, can we get people that will get our advanced features? Um, and will they, like... In the App Store, you can't do subscriptions right now without going through the Apple Pay or yeah. or, or the thirty percent cut that Apple gets. Like literally, funding a dev team in a subscription based model on on Bitcoin just isn't possible in the App Store today. They'll ban you immediately. They won't let your app go through. So I'm like, this is one of the features where I'm really excited about. Like, what have Bitcoin wallets been capable of this whole time? That have, that have never been able to get in the app store with those features. And, mm. and subscriptions are one of them, not just for us. So if you go back to um, your Nostra wallet connection strings, you should see that there's a new one in there for um, for Mutiny. And, you know, you don't, it, it doesn't really do anything. You can disable it anytime. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to be a subscriber, you just simply, you can either not pay or you can disable it. But we want to open this up to everyone. We want to see what, subscriptions could be like for merchants, for Nostra relays, for um, supporting someone in an opens fans kind of way. Like, let's see what subscriptions on Lightning could look like. And, and you know, if you're in the App Store, you can build something like this today. So let's experiment with for it. For someone like me who forgets about loads of subscriptions I have as well, it's great. If you get prompted to resubscribe, there's loads I've had open for like a year that I didn't even know I still had. Huh. I mean, look, I love it. i tell you why I love it is... Um, I'm sometimes between my laptop and my mobile trying to make lightning payments and I'm emailing lightning mm. addresses to my phone and then copying and pasting it in to send it. To, to be able to do it straight from my browser is just really cool. I love it. Yep. Uh, and I just love the fact that you're doing this. To, to expand a little bit more on the business model, just, yeah. just so that's there. We're exploring a lot of different ones. We don't know what's going to work or when it's not going to work. Are we going to get enough from this? Um, any advanced feature that is just front-end only that doesn't require any services from us, we want that to be available for free for self-hosters. So if you self-host it, you go through that effort, you get these front-end related features for free. Um, we want to do things like DLCs in the future, like maybe we can monetize that way um, we we do want to be an LSP eventually um, we, we we only raised a little bit to start out and we didn't want to have to raise a lot just to fund a lightning node and get it to be a good LSP for the user like I think we got a thousand or more channels that opened up over the last few days wow. um, and you know Voltus can do, do that they're a lot more well funded than we are um, but the the con to that is when you pay that 10k sats for Voltus to send a, a uh, channel to you, open a channel to you, they get that sats, those sats, not us. So um, we do want to run an LSP eventually and we can monetize off of that. Um, DLC related things, we can monetize off of that. Um, but we're still exploring what it looks like to to monetize an open source wallet. Um, and if you're going through the app store, you almost can't do that today yeah. without giving Apple a cut. And who, I mean, maybe, dude, Apple, accept Bitcoin, and maybe we'll talk about giving you a 30% cut. But until then, like... Go fuck yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, listen, man, we love it. Uh, love that you're doing this. Anything we can do to support you, uh, let us know. If people want to check it out, go to mutinywallet.com. Um, maybe you'll make the money on these cool t-shirts, man. That too. I mean, Paul wanted to turn Mutiny into a lifestyle brand at one point. So. Dude, I would have paid for this. Yeah. I would have given it. Yeah. You were yeah. meant to. Was that? <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> no. I actually got two. I got one for my son. There I think he'd like oh, it. Oh, that's that's great. I'm glad. Yeah, but uh, like you're a friend of the show. Anything you need, you give us a shout out. We love that, this. Peter. This is very cool. And you know, my my signal usually comes from other Bitcoiners, and every everyone I know talking about this, who backs this, are high signal Bitcoiners. So yeah, we wish you the best. Stay in touch. Anything you need, give us a shout, uh, and we will pimp this everywhere. Awesome. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Thank man. You guys.